Okay, let's just cut to the chase. There have been many, many, many Minecraft challenge runs. The problem is, they're all way too casual. And of course, I'm no casual. Welcome to the Minecraft no left click, no jumping, no sprinting, no sneaking, no armor run on hard difficulty. First, let's start with how I set this up. In order to prevent myself from left clicking, jumping, and sneaking, I mapped all of those actions to keys that were not technically on my keyboard. Sprinting, on the other hand, could not be prevented by unbinding, as any time you double tap the forward movement key, your character will sprint. Because of this, the only thing I could do was try my hardest not to double tap W, which happened pretty frequently. Anytime a rule was broken for any reason, I would immediately use slash kill and make sure that I did not receive any potential benefits from my rule break. I was not allowed to use slash kill in any other circumstance. Also, the rules are actually more restrictive than they seem. When I say no jumping, what I really mean is no action that is bound to the key jump is mapped to. In this instance, that means no swimming upwards either. This reasoning was applied to sneaking and sprinting as well. I was, however, allowed to use left click for menuing and inventory management. Now that you know the rules, let's get into the run. It immediately became apparent that this run would be a nightmare. A simple one block high drop in this run became a one way cliff that I currently had no way of scaling. So if I wanted to go down, I had to make sure that I didn't leave anything important at a higher elevation. Therefore, my first goal was to get out of this wooded area and reach a desert, since the elevation there doesn't change much and it would be filled with plenty of sand to make slabs, allowing me to traverse upwards. I plan to make wooden slabs to start, but of course I can't punch wood, so how am I going to get blocks? Seems bad, right? You don't know the half of it. In addition to getting killed by the creepers, their explosions destroy most of the resources they blow up. Each block only has a one-third chance of dropping when destroyed by a creeper, so even if I was lucky enough to dodge all the other mobs and get a creeper to blow up a tree, there's a good chance that I wouldn't even get a single block of wood. Additionally, if another creeper happened to explode in the vicinity, all the dropped resources would be completely deleted by the second explosion. Seems worse, right? You don't even know the quarter of it. The absolute worst aspect of this technique was that the creepers blow up the ground, and the dropped resources fall inside the crater, and I can't jump. At this point in the run, if I got stuck in a hole, I was stranded there until a mob killed me. I couldn't even starve myself because there was no way to exert enough energy to drain my hunger bar due to the rules of the run. Sometimes, this meant I had to wait a whole in-game day for new mobs to spawn at night. This happened so frequently throughout the beginning of the run that I actually worked on completing my Pokemon Crystal but every Pokemon is level 100 except my own run while waiting. Also, as a quick recap, if I fall underwater at this point in the game, I just drown since according to my rules, both swimming upwards and sprint swimming are banned. After a while, I found that one of the best strategies was to get a creeper to blow up, go down into the crater, collect the items, throw the items as high as I could, get killed by something, and then repeat the process until I got the items up to the elevation I wanted. With any luck, the zombies wouldn't steal my blocks and I'd have at least a couple of resources to work with. After a few iterations of this routine, I started to notice another problem. If the explosions were too close together, the craters would completely take out parts of my accessible world, forcing me to spend precious resources to rebuild a path. As a side note, someone in chat suggested that I use boats to get around, but while I could get into the boat, I couldn't get out since that would require sneaking in most circumstances. Even with all of these restrictions, it only took me a couple of hours to make a crafting table and some slabs, and I set off to find my desert. After a few more hours, I realized that while I may not be a casual, I am a massive fucking idiot because why the hell wouldn't I just create different worlds until I spawned into a desert? Upon creating my fourth world, I finally found that crispy biome, but it was even better than that. Right next to the desert, there was a village that didn't even require a single slab to reach. Food, shelter, a thriving society that definitely wasn't going to be obliterated by collateral damage, what more could a man ask for? A mob farm. A mob farm is what I asked for. Obviously, having creepers constantly blowing up my world and killing me was not going to get me very far in this run. TNT, on the other hand, is a much more efficient resource gathering device. Now, while I could kill creepers with a bow or flint and steel, those were not easily available, so I decided that a mob farm would be essential to the completion of the run. But first, I needed to get the materials, and that was no trivial task. To put it simply, I'd rather be trapped in an hour-long night terror than go through collecting these materials again. There were so, 
So many mobs. It didn't matter if I was able to make a creeper blow up, because going back to pick up the items was like going through a fucking war zone. But like, really slowly because I couldn't sprint. Half the time was spent waiting in holes I had fallen into, from which only Death's sweet embrace could rescue me. One time, while I was waiting for Death Chan to smother me in her bosom, an iron golem came and killed every enemy that approached me, ensuring that I stayed in this one block torture pit for as long as possible. One thing you need to understand about this run is how agonizing it was to complete the simplest of tasks. For example, I needed to get up one block in order to retrieve some stuff from an earlier death. Because of how stupendously valuable slabs were, I wasn't going to waste them. So, to get up that one block in the village, I had to go all the way around to a slab I placed earlier, nearly quadrupling the distance I had to travel. And again, it was a distance I had to travel by walking, not sprinting. For many hours, I blew up stuff with a creeper, collected the items in whatever way I could, ran back to a chest in the village, dropped off whatever I had, and then repeated that whole process. This resulted in literally hundreds of deaths over the course of several streams. I completely overestimated the utility the desert would serve me. Sure, there was sand everywhere, but I couldn't make a single slab until I had gotten at least 12 sand blocks. While I eventually got enough slabs to move around a bit more, the village got completely Swiss cheesed, as did its entire population, save for one dude that somehow got frozen inside his home. I tried my absolute best to make sure that he would survive. Not because I cared for him, but so that he could live to tell the tale of how I insidiously lured legions of monsters to bomb his town and massacre his friends and family, all for that sweet, sweet gamer clout. One interesting thing that came out of this hell was a mechanic we called hydro hopping. If you are submerged in water and then walk yourself out of it onto dry land, the game will automatically make you hop. Note that I'm not hitting the spacebar at all, so a hydro hop is technically not a jump by my rules. Because it was kind of a cool thing and something that would be very annoying to avoid, I allowed myself to use it, but it really didn't have that much of an impact on the run. In addition to hydro hopping, there were a few more texts that made the run a bit more manageable. One of them was to bring a block of sand and a cactus to kill myself if I ever got stuck in a crater, but it required a block lower than my current position in order to place the cactus at the right height. Another strat was suffocating myself with some aptly placed sand if there were any blocks above me. And finally, I started using Hus to kill me in the daytime to acquire items dropped during the night, and in conjunction with throwing items upwards, this strat substantially increased my resource hauls. Yes, I am aware that the three strats I just mentioned all involve offing myself, but that's just how this run is. Anyway, before the annihilation of the village, I was able to get the golems killed enough times to craft a hopper, and after many, many hours, I finally had most of the resources I needed. The type of mob farm I planned to build was a modified version of the creeper farm constructed by Chapman. Before building this mob farm, however, I need to illuminate you as to how building works in this run. So left clicking was not allowed, but there are no restrictions on right clicking, so I can just place blocks normally, right? Wrong. I can't sneak, which you're probably thinking just makes placing blocks up high more dangerous. It does, but the problem was insignificant compared to not being able to shift click. Because I couldn't place blocks while sneaking, this meant I couldn't connect one hopper to another, at least not in the traditional casual way. Trying to place a hopper against another one without sneaking simply opens the hopper's inventory. What I was going to have to do was place one hopper against a block so that the output was facing the correct direction. I would then carefully place TNT a specific distance from the hopper and blow up the block in front of it, allowing me to repeat the whole process again in order to have the outputs go into a chest. Like I said, the simplest tasks become complex torture quests due to the rules of this run. Unfortunately, I could not yet perform the strat as I did not have enough TNT nor a second hopper. To get started, I placed the single hopper I did have, hoping it wouldn't mess with the efficiency too much. The most stressful part of building this entire thing was the fact that if I messed up somewhere, the only way I could undo my mistake was by using TNT, which of course was the entire reason I was building this cursed monstrosity in the first place. The fact that a single screw-up could cost me hours of my life made me so anxious that I not only test-built the mob farm in a creative world, but I did it twice, and then another time making sure not to use any controls that weren't allowed in the run. I was constantly going back to my creative world to make sure I was building everything to specifications. Also, you'll notice that the entire structure is above ground since I can't dig down, and because I can't jump, I had to make large slab staircases in order to reach the higher parts of the structure. 
As mentioned previously, not being able to sneak forced me to inch my way over to the edge and aim at really small targets in order to place the blocks in the air, which predictably resulted in me falling down several times. After the most stressful Minecraft build of my life, I had done it. I had made a fucking mistake, damn it, damn it, damn it! I forgot to put the water up here before I closed it off, but you know me, I have a giant ass brain. I would just use a wooden slab to get up, place the water, and then burn the slab and everything would be great. <sighs> I'll just have to roll with it for now. Except I can't roll with it for now because I made another damn mistake. I had forgotten to put these trap doors in the spawning room, which tricked the enemies into thinking there is a floor where the hole is, baiting them to fall in. Fortunately, I was able to kill some creepers with some bows and arrows that I had dropped from skeletons earlier, allowing me to blow up the spawner to get inside and holy shit that's a lot of damage. I rebuilt the mob farm, this time with the trap doors, and used the lava from the forge in the village as the kill mechanism. After all my efforts, I had a half-completed, incredibly scuffed mob farm. So, does this thing even work? Well, to find out, I had to be far above the mob farm. You see, in order to minimize the number of mobs spawning on the surface as well as in caverns below the surface, I had to make sure that only the mob farm was within the mob spawning radius, which, as indicated by the video I was basing my mob farm off of, was 128 blocks. So, I picked up all of my supplies and moved to the tower in the village, which would be my main base for the rest of the run. From there, I slowly built a staircase of slabs that would hang above the mob farm. Building it, of course, came with the challenges you would expect. But after a lot of slow building, I was about 128 blocks above the spawner. I knew that the spawner would be really slow due to the mistakes I made, but I was more than willing to allow my MacBook Pro to completely run out of cycles while idling for TNT. Which, uh, <laughs> it started to. I did this for several hours, and then went to check on my progress. After all that time, the spawner was making a modest amount of jack shit. I checked around the spawner and it didn't take me long to realize what had happened. See that hole there? That's not a block that I forgot to place. It had been stolen by an Enderman. And almost all of the blocks the spawner was built with could be stolen by Enderman. Since there was no way I was going to blow up the whole thing and start over with new blocks, I just had to resort to patching it up every time this happened. I fixed the spawner and once again began my idling routine for a couple more hours. This time, upon my return to the mob farm, I found that it was making a hefty dick all what the fuck is wrong with this stupid piece of shit. I checked and confirmed that mobs did indeed spawn in it, and even though there was obvious flaws, I should have been able to get at least something. That's when I stared at the wiki a little bit harder. See, the model I based the spawner on used cats, which scare the creepers and push them into the hole. Because I thought it would be too much of a headache to find and keep alive such a vastly inferior pet, I did without the cat, planning to just be content with randomized movement instead. What I found out was that the creepers in my mob spawner weren't moving at all. You see, while mobs spawn within a 128 block radius of the player, they don't actually have any idle movement until they are within 32 blocks of the player. Cats are able to override this function and move the creepers on their own, allowing the player to go up to the 128 block point to reduce all the other spawns. In my case, they were just frozen in place once they spawned in. With this newfound knowledge, I built a bridge from the staircase that was at a much better height, being within 32 blocks but above 24 blocks, the latter being the lower bound for hostile mobs to spawn. I also built a phantom protecting shed that reminded me of the first ever Minecraft house I built when I was 10 years old. Speaking of 10 years, that's about how long I waited before checking the spawner again and for fuck's sake, FINALLY! I was now getting about one gunpowder every hour. Brutal, but it's something. After enough millennia, I finally had some TNT to use. Compared to creepers, TNT felt like an explosion of pure euphoria every time I used it. I no longer had to wait all night for a creeper to spawn, nor did I have to suffer through a plethora of deaths just to get a stack of sand. And the best part was that the TNT drops all of the blocks it breaks, which on average is three times more than what drops from a creeper. Man, I was rolling in sandstone slabs. No longer did I have such limited movement. No longer did I have to stand in a crater waiting to die. I felt so free. But then it was back to work. 
I blew up the wooden block I had mistakenly placed in the spawner and increased its efficiency even more by placing torches around to decrease irrelevant spawning. But I wasn't done yet. I blew up the mob room and doubled its size to push my spawner's efficiency even further beyond. Now, despite all this, I was still only getting about one TNT every four or so hours, so I had to increase my efficiency with another hopper. Since I was near a Badlands biome, there were a good number of abandoned mineshafts around. I had attempted to go into them earlier in the run, but the lack of slabs and torches made it too difficult a venture. Slabs were not an issue anymore, and I was able to get torches through a combination of breaking dead bushes for sticks and blowing up self-made tree farms for the charcoal. Along with my trusty lava bucket to burn enemies, I explored the mine chest for iron. It didn't take too long to find, but what did take a long time was killing enough creepers to get the gunpowder. After around two hours, I blew up my spawner for the final time- Ah, fuck. For the final- Ah, fuck. Shit. Well, after that debacle, I had to rebuild the entire front part of the spawner. After I got it patched up, all the upgrades I did boosted my mob farm up to 5 gunpowder or 1 TNT per hour. Hot damn, that's good! And it wasn't just gunpowder, I also got bones, arrows, rotten flesh, and other useful items from the spawner. Now, for reference, I spent over 163 hours idling for TNT. It was rough, but not having to explode creepers anymore was a huge relief, and the amount of resources I was able to procure due to the 100% drop rate was especially tasty. Just in case though, I always kept some emergency TNT, slabs, and ladders in a chest just in case I got in a bind. Whilst building the mob farm and in between idling sessions, I also engaged in numerous other ventures. One of them was constructing a sheep farm to create a limitless supply of wool. This allowed me to lessen my dependence on TNT, which before now was the only reasonable way to acquire building blocks. Using some hay bales I found in the village, I was able to lure and breed sheep until I had a plethora of the buggers. To keep up with breeding demands, I also started a wheat farm near the spawner, harvesting the wheat using a water bucket. I also built a chicken farm and a cow farm that I would later use for food. Finally, I attempted to repent for my sin of total disregard for virtual life by rebuilding most of the village with wool. It looked about as good as you would expect from someone who doesn't give a shit about Minecraft NPCs. You hear that, you rectangular prism nose looking ass motherfucker? You better remember what I did for you. Next to the sheep farm, there was a convenient lava pool that I used to make another portal. It took me around 15 minutes to build, mostly out of sheer paranoia that I would accidentally create a cobblestone, or even worse, an obsidian block that would force me to start over. Thankfully, it was a pretty typical non-diamond pickaxe build with a lot more frames and staircases in order to reach the top parts. Despite all the upset people in chat telling me that I was an amateur and was taking way too long, I successfully built my portal without any serious mistakes. Now it was time for the nether, and holy shit did I spawn in a terrible spot. Fun fact, this challenge was done right before the biome update for the nether went up, so I had absolutely no experience with it. Funner fact, I actually haven't played Minecraft since the Wither update, and I haven't actually ever beaten the Ender Dragon. Anyway, because I was in the air, I was forced to make my own path, which, again, without the sneak button was extremely dangerous. Since death was inevitable, I dropped most of the blocks on the bridge while I was building so that when I did fall, I didn't lose everything. In addition to the ordinary dangers of the nether, I was always paranoid of getting softlocked in a one block wide hole without any enemy to kill me. Due to the spiky generation of basalt deltas in particular, I was nervous that I would fall into a hole where the spikes surrounding me would prevent enemies from climbing in and getting me out. Luckily, I never ran into that problem. While I did make a few sky bridges to look for a fortress, they ultimately were abandoned because they took too long to make and, when I ran into a ceiling, there was little I could do to get around. I did test out a strider, but I couldn't find a way to get off of it nor a way to easily kill it, so that wasn't going to work either. In the end, I just went down to ground level and kept exploring by building bridges closer to the ground. It was a very long and arduous journey filled with much pain and suffering. Magma cubes would spawn on my bridges and leave me no choice but to accept my fate in the lava. Skeletons would snipe me from a mile away. Gas would be gas. The mob farm didn't produce enough arrows to justify fighting all of these mobs, so I just had to avoid them as best I could. After a stomach-turning number of hours and deaths, I had finally found a nether fortress. Before we go in, however, I need you to understand how absolutely excruciating being in the nether was. 
Getting anywhere was a massive pain, and danger was ever-present. Look at how long this pathway to the fortress was. Every single time I died, which was a lot, I had to walk, yes, walk, this entire path to get back to the nether fortress. And for a majority of my time there, there was little protection, so I would frequently die on the way there. Even worse, if I had finally achieved my goal, I had to walk the entire path back, where I risked losing the important items permanently to lava. And if, perchance, my anxiety accidentally tapped the W key a little too quickly, it was an immediate death no matter how gruesome the consequences. Now that you understand that, we can get back to the run. I just had to kill these blazes as fast as possible and get out of here. Thankfully, I had accumulated more than enough arrows from the mob farm, and I had an enchanted bow I lifted from a skeleton. The biggest threat while trying to get the rods were the piglins. Not because they were hyper-aggressive and persistent, but because they reminded me that the old zombie pigmen models were no more. Fighting through the tears, it only took me about an hour to get the blaze rods I needed. With the blaze rods safely stored at my base, I now had a new problem to tackle. Ender pearls. Endermen just teleported away if I tried to shoot them with a bow, and attempting to blow them up with TNT wasn't a viable strat either. I even built a fort of sorts that would trap Endermen, which I then tried to kill with TNT, cactuses, and fire, but none of those ideas worked. I couldn't trade with piglins since I couldn't wear armor, so what could I do? Well, the answer was simple. Capitalism. As an American, it is my duty to bring wealth and prosperity to peaceful peoples, even if I must do so by force. I set out looking for a village that actually had living inhabitants unlike my own. Don't worry, I didn't forget about old Bill here, but I don't know if he considers his current state of unending traumatic flashbacks as living. Upon finding a village rather close to my base, I began my empire by humbly selling sticks and wheat. Once the villagers knew who I was and trusted me, I made four looms and coerced millennials to get a real job, like buying my abundance of wool, an operation that definitely did not start as an elaborate aphrodisiac dependency scheme involving bread. I then monopolized the entire market, earning massive amounts of emeralds. I made a brewing stand, created a cleric, and was able to upgrade him by selling rotten flesh and then buying his wares with the emeralds I made. Eventually, he started selling ender pearls, and after buying arrows from the Fletcher, I was set to take on the Ender Dragon. I want to make a quick note that if you are doing any challenge run in Minecraft, your first question should be, how can I exploit the villager working class? I was too foolish to do that at the start of this run, and it could have saved me a huge amount of time. Anyway, the path to the stronghold wasn't anything remarkable, just a lot of slabs. Once I had gotten above the stronghold, I built a small base nearby containing food, bows, arrows, slabs, ladders, and torches for the upcoming fight. And then, it was time to start tunneling down. Detonating the land like a Link who couldn't jump, I reached the stronghold rather rapidly. Thankfully, the portal frame was close by. I jumped in, climbed fast, and blasted ass. For the cages, I used beds instead of my precious TNT to get to the crystals. There were virtually no consequences for dying in this fight. I'd blow up a crystal, die, respawn back at my temporary base, suit up with new equipment, and then repeat the process. After destroying all the crystals, his ass was mine to smash. I mostly just used arrows since the bed technique was kinda lackluster, and before long, I had defeated the Ender Dragon. Easy baby game. Holy shit, I couldn't believe how easy this was. Which was why, even though I technically beat the game without left clicking, without jumping, without sprinting, without sneaking, without armor on hard difficulty, I'm not done yet. You seriously think I wouldn't do an all boss run? It's wither time, baby! Catch the stunning and horrendously painful conclusion in part two. And like, if you haven't already, like, why aren't you subscribed? Click that sub button, leave a comment, and a like. See ya, nerds.